Hello and welcome to another in the occasional series, Chip Chat. And with me this morning, I have Count and Sully from Gamecast. Say hello. 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 No. Oh. I like a resistance. <laughs> no. It's rage against the machine. Yeah, it goes a bit. It goes against I won't the grain. do what you tell me. <laughs> Edgy. I uh, I was also hoping to have Grant with me this morning, but unfortunately he's unable to do it because he's uh, taking his dog to the vet. So, uh, well, maybe on another one. But anyway, this morning, if we want to get to it, this morning we want to talk about our favourite devices of all time, and that would be gaming devices. So, But I wanted to talk about my favourite dildo. Well, yeah, you never said You devices, can talk about Joe. that in you the said... outtakes, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Your favourite deal. You've got a collection of them, have you? <laughs> yeah. uh, Count's getting very excited because Lego are about to release a Lego <laughs> dildo. That would be painful. That's a very rigid dildo, yeah. That would be very painful. <laughs> I've stepped on those things. Not dildos, Lego. <laughs> Phrasing. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, oh, and I just dumped myself on the floor there as well while I was laughing. Well. Anyway, to the point. We uh, are going to be talking about our favourite devices of all time. And uh, we've all picked out a couple of devices and we've got some honourable mentions as well. So uh, I'm actually going to start. Basically, my favourite devices of all, all time start with, uh, there were plenty of devices before I got to this, but it really started with the PC and with Doom. And the reason I um, remember the PC and Doom was I went down to London to stop with a friend of mine and he said, come in here because he had a little office and he, he started it up and he said, take a look at this. And I, I've, you, you guys know, I've played lots of games before and, and you know, I had the N64 and, and I fiddled with the Ataris and various different consoles over the years. When he sat me down in front of Doom, it was the most amazing thing that I'd ever seen at that time. I mean, if you never experienced Doom when it was first released, you won't maybe won't get this because you'll have been spoiled by all the you know graphical intensity of, of modern games. I, I get this. I get this. I had the same experience with Halo and the original Xbox. Yeah, we'll see. Th th this is what happens when you see something that is that groundbreaking. And that's what happened. I mean, we had Wolfenstein beforehand, but... I, um, apart from the fact I hadn't really mm. seen a lot of Wolfenstein, Wolfenstein wasn't of the same league as Doom. So basically what happened when, when I walked into that room and he showed me this and then he, you know, he sat me mm. down, he said, you know, show me the keyboard and mouse. And we didn't have WASD. It was the uh, arrows and we were all trying to work out how to make it work. And then people worked out that WSAD would, was the best way of doing it. Or, you know, I think some people transpose it along a bit, but it took a while for me to get used to using it with the mouse and everything, but once I once it clicked, it was amazing. And graphically as well, it was it was unreal. It wasn't unreal, it was Doom, but you get my point. And so I think you'll find that was, was in just... the build engine. <laughs> yeah, this was the uh, Doom engine, I seem to remember, yeah. Um <laughs> And so, you know, there was Doom and then, and, and the thing is they came out thick and fast as well. We had Doom in 93, then Doom 2 in 94. And then by 96, we had Quake. And then, you know, December, I think 97 was Quake 2. And, um, you, you know, it just came thick and fast. There were so many games that came out, you know, the Doom clones and things like Duke Nukem, obviously, in the, as you say, in the build engine. We had Heretic, Hexen, and they just kept coming. And then later on, we had other things as well. We were around about, well, around about the same time, we had X-Wing, then TIE Fighter, then X-Wing versus TIE Fighter, which came out in 97. And then Half-Life arrived in 98. So that whole period through the 90s was, was just amazing. And I bought my first PC because of Doom, and I built my first oh. PC because of Quake. And I, you know, I remember when Quake came out and it had the Nine Inch Nail soundtrack and it just, it just blew my mind. And for me, that period of PC gaming was a real golden age because it was, it was new and it was different and it, it, it really did push things forward in terms of what, what was possible. And when I looked at consoles at that time, they just didn't interest me because of what I was seeing on PC and... It was amazing. I mean, I don't know what you guys think of, of, of PC gaming from that period. I know 
you probably weren't there when it all started. You, you, were you built, born? I don't know. When you started getting into it, I was a baby, if that yeah. helps you. <laughs> yeah. If that makes you feel nice so, and old. Oh, yeah, that makes me feel very old, yeah. Uh, yeah, what year was this, uh, Joe, for the listeners? 93. That was that was Doom, and so that. Oh, I um, wasn't like even I say, born then. <laughs> Ninety three. Yeah, I was three years old. So <laughs> I do remember hitting the SNES, though. That was my first first ever interaction with Doom, and I was far too young. And it was my dad's copy of Doom, and he used to lock it away in his car boot so I couldn't touch it. <laughs> That's my it is only boot. interaction with the original <laughs> Doom when it released. His boot. I don't know why in his boot. <laughs> What a strange place to put it. Did he have a PC in there as well? He used to go out there and secretly open the boot and have a go, you know. <laughs> nah, I think I think he used to take him to his friend's house or something. Like he'd have a box of games in there. So I'm not 100% sure. But yeah, that was my first interaction with Doom. Not the best version of Doom either. But yeah, I was three years old and 93. So wasn't really my era for gaming no i mean the, the thing for me as well at that time was we, we you know they talk about games as service now but games back then really were a mm. service not in the not in the way they think of them now but you'd get doom and you'd play doom and you'd finish doom and then you'd have all the mods that would be coming out you know all the wad files and you know we're still getting wads coming out now i mean mm -hmm. romero himself released sigil what this year and and you we had things like Alien Doom and and so many you know different versions of of that game and we used to change the sound files and all you know all sorts of stuff. I think I mentioned this to you before. We had a, a situation where a mate of mine changed the sound files so it sounded like another mate of mine who was from Br Birmingham. So <laughs> all the all the monsters were running around going all right, all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just cracking uh, it up, especially it. when he saw us playing it and was, you know, not really offended, but it was like, what are you doing? <laughs> In a brummy accent. But yeah, so that, that was my, that was my experience of, of PC gaming and, and, and the early days of PC gaming, it's changed a lot since then. And, and like I say, things just started to change as we got towards 2000, still a lot of good stuff coming out, but those were heady days. And uh, I remember them really fondly. Uh, oh, Dark Forces as well. I remember that was the other thing. We got so many of the, the uh, LucasArts games coming out at that point as well. A lot of LucasArts. Mm -hmm. And it was, ju it was just amazing. Game after game after game. All brilliant. All very dated now. If you look at them now, they, you know, graphically they're left in the dirt. But yeah, it was amazing. But not dead because that mod scene and open source code on a lot of these games keep them alive. Oh, yeah. They're still, like, yeah, still. They're still coming. Yeah, some of the games died. I mean, I, I'm, a, I, you know, I, I wish. Mm. I mean, this was '99, but Kingpin came out in '99 with a Cypress Hill soundtrack as well. <laughs> and, uh... Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at, mate? Uh, nothing, nothing at all. Nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> I would have liked to have seen another Kingpin game, but yeah, there was there was a lot of stuff that came out during that period that was. Good in its own way, or, you know, I mean, as I say, with Doom, it was groundbreaking. It changed, changed everything for me. But anyway, let's move on to the next one. I think we were going to talk about the N64 next. Yes. Ah, that's me. That's <laughs> well, one well of my done. picks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, I remember. Uh, yeah, so the N64, I think, to me, was probably... Well, I mean, we all know the graphical leap it took forward. It was one of those first consoles that I think really started to play around and push 3D spaces, um, environments, I should say. Um, and, you know, titles that specifically come to mind, uh, games like Banjo-Kazooie, um, Super Mario 64. Um, Nintendo was really, I think, the pioneer of pushing a lot of those 3D uh, environments. Um and for me, it only being really, I think, my second console ever, and I previously coming from the uh, SNES, uh, dropping into an environment and a world where everything was 3D for the first time was absolutely uh, gobsmacking. And, it, you know, it wasn't just... I, I was talking to someone about this today. It's not just the fact that, you know, we had 3D environments and, you know, it had a lot of cool games, but Nintendo specifically 
their titles have a certain, and I don't think this is nostalgia. I think it's something else. Like there really is something special about a lot of their titles, even to this day with the Switch. I think there's a, something special about their titles, and I think that's one of the reasons why the N64 I think still holds up to this day. Um, I don't think it's just nostalgia goggles, which is something I tried to avoid with this list because um, I could have easily picked the SNES, uh, but I think I was too young. I think it would have been nostalgia. But the N64, and uh, again, I can't stress how mind-blowing the 3D environments were. Um, and it, you know, th- even for shooters, like it changed the game for so many different titles and it changed the way we played games in so many ways. Um, albeit they probably could have gotten the controller a little bit better. The controller was definitely a bit funky. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> playing Goldeneye in a single stick. We're trying to be um, a fighter plane. <laughs> Oh, golden <laughs> exactly. eye. So yeah. It was the controller was a little bit spastic, but uh you know, I think there's just something special about the N64. And I think it is because it was pushing it was my first experience with 3D environments whereas previously I'd come from all 2D side scrolling platformers. So it really did shake up my video game world, I guess you could say. Um and they, and you know, of course, the N64 hasn't got the biggest library of games going around in compared to other Nintendo catalogs or the PlayStation 2, for example. Um, But what it did have was, uh, I think it was definitely quality over quantity. Um, Yeah, so that would be, I'm not going to say probably my all-time favourite. I'm going to save that for later on, but uh, it's definitely up there. I think something I just wanted to comment on here was, was when you were talking about Nintendo being special and the N64 being special. One of the things that strikes me about Nintendo and and this almost follows on from the PC point. It, it, they are, are almost polar opposites. The yeah. N64 and the PC are almost polar opposites because the, the the great thing about the PC is that it was you, it was so open and you could do so many things with it. And you you know, but what came with that was that often things were broken and wouldn't work properly, mm-hmm. especially back then when you had to fuck around with everything and you know IRQs and all and just trying to get a game to work could be a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Whereas the N64. And consoles in general, you know, you just plug in your cartridge absolutely, uh, or disc later on and they work. And yeah. Nintendo did that to the absolute nth degree. Their games, and even now, you know, you come up to, to now with the Switch. Generally speaking, if you get a N- Nintendo first party game, it bloody works. It bloody works well. Everything's honed to, to where it should be. And that, to me, that that's what makes Nintendo games special. And, and I only came to this conclusion fairly late. I've had a friend of mine who's been going on for years about how great Nintendo are for that. You know, for, that's for one reason why. And I and I think you know, I remember sitting down and playing the N sixty four around people's houses at parties and things like that. Mm. And it's just fun. You know, you know, it's going to work. You couldn't do that with a PC. Certainly not back then. You couldn't sit around and and just it would work and not in times out of 10 you spent most of the evening trying to get things to work yeah so yeah yeah it's hard to quantify that uh magic formula that nintendo have on all their titles like obviously their quality and consistency of quality is exceptional but um like my friend and i again were talking today about the playstation 1 and the n64 about how he really liked you know the skating games and you know, Tony Hawk and all this other kind of stuff, you know, the original GTA and all this. And I was like, but do you, do you feel like those games are like, are like really special, like really unique and there's just something special about them? And he's like, no, not really. I just like enjoyed them at the time and I think I look back at them with nostalgia. And, you know, I think we both agree that there is, it's almost like there's this Nintendo formula that just kind of, I think, captivates people. Like, even if you're not a huge fan, you can sit down and you could watch, like, somebody play a Nintendo game and it will captivate you. They're kind of like the the Disney of the video game world, yeah, aren't they? Or the in a way? Pixar. I'd say the Pixar. Like, there's a special sort of magic that is, like, at work there. Yeah. It's, yeah, I definitely yeah, go along with that. It's like the little Nintendo spark that just. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's just something that. I think more than anything, it comes with practice because you know yeah. they've been going for years. There's so much practice at this, and that's I what think, it comes down yeah. to at the end of the day. I think you're right, and I think it comes down to uh, a lot of freedom for developers and giving developers breathing time and letting them run with what they want a lot of the time as well. Because um, you know, like I mean, look at how they reinvented so many of their IPs and franchises over the year. 
Like, and then you look at how many other franchises on every other side of the fence other than Nintendo have stagnated and just died off because they haven't had enough innovation. They're not afraid to innovate. Sometimes it doesn't work, but they're not afraid to just run with an idea and go for it. And I think that, you know, that is a part of that spark as well. And when it works, it works really well. Look at Breath of the Wild. Um, you know, there's so many examples of it, them just nailing it over the years and just kind of capturing that magic in a bottle. So what would be your N64 game what, or, or games? What would be the ones that really stood oh, out for you? It's really, really, really tough for me to pick. Um, I didn't have a huge library of N64 games. They were quite expensive when I was playing mm. on that system. Like I was only, I'm probably somewhere between seven and 12. I was probably on the N64. Um, I think it came out, was it 96 and 97 it came out? Mm. Yeah, Something it would have been like about that, yeah. seven years old when it came out then. But I think, like, I was playing Mario Kart, Mario 64, Super Smash Brothers, GoldenEye, uh, Banjo-Kazooie, uh, a little game called Destruction Dirt Derby, uh, Perfect Dark. Um, I, you know, it's probably 10 solid games just there. But if, if I had to really boil it down to um, games I look back now, possibly with a little bit of nostalgia, but if I had to pick one, probably has to be Super Mario 64, I think. Again, it's just mm. you lose yourself in that world, you know. It's just captures you. Um, and then other than that, I think uh, a really good party game was uh, Super Smash Brothers as well. That was a lot of fun. And, of course, Mario Kart, yeah. you know, honorable mention. It's hard to pick because that, that console really was, I think, quality over quantity. Everything was really good. Quality over quantity, I think, sums it up. I think it had a really good library. It wasn't a huge library, but then you compare it to something like the Wii, which had a huge library, and there was quality on the Wii as well, but there was an awful lot of shovelware mm -hmm. on the Wii, and you could get snowed under with, you know, all the crap. It was much more difficult to find decent games on the Wii. Yeah, I agree with that. But, um, yeah, uh, that, so that's the N64. So uh, moving on from the N64, who's covering this? Is this? This is you count, isn't it? The PS2? PS2, yes. <laughs> well... We were talking about shovelware. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was the, that's the one issue with the PS2. That there's a lot of shovelware on that thing. Terrible 3D graphics as well. Oh. Oh well, they're not exactly any better than its competitors at the time. <laughs> you know, all the games you've shown me though, count. No. It's like oh, no, none of them are exactly graphical powerhouses. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, yeah. Um, what have I shown you? Oh, do you remember Road Trip Adventure? Yes, that's the one you showed me. <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. The first game I ever got for PS2. <laughs> it has not aged. I I love it and it's terrible. <laughs> So, so so far with the PS2, what we've got is it was terrible, but it's one of your favourite consoles of all so time. Yes! Gonna make... <laughs> <laughs> I think there's going to be a lot of PS2 fans out there who aren't going to be too happy about that. Well, they can live with it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't did it care. do any i mean from a hardware standpoint did it do anything in terms of you know DVDs. moving things forward did it did it it was quite good hardware wise what it did it did a very good thing of getting people into gaming because it worked as a dvd player that was considerably ah, yes. cheaper than all of the dvd mm -hmm. players on the market at the time mm -hmm. which helped it sell it did help it and it got a lot of people going well i've bought this thing I can play DVDs, that's great, but oh, I can play games on it as well. Oh, I might try that. That's what that to me is what the PS2 represents more than anything. It's when gaming started to grow up and become this more mainstream thing. I think a lot of that is probably because of the PS2 and, mm. you know, the the influence that it had over like the people who were buying the system. I, I think that's absolutely right. And I do I do think that made a massive difference to the way in which people perceived video games. To go out and, and be looking to buy a DVD player and see that the cheapest DVD player on the market is actually a games console and you can get to play games on it. And then you sit down and you play games on it. I You know, I know people who, who went out and bought a PlayStation 2 and, and you know, they end up playing games on it. They're, they're not really big gamers, but they started taking notice of video yeah. games. And, and that can't be under... You know, you, you cannot under appreciate that and how that, you know, helped to change the way the market went 
and the way people perceived that whole market. Yeah, it was really good value and it's hard to, to say no to good value because imagine how many families would have been on the fence about maybe just buying a video game console, but when dad also gets his DVD player, you know. It's like, oh, well, that, that works for me. I can watch all of the pornography <laughs> I have stored. <laughs> Done. <laughs> <laughs> Don't joke, porn sells systems. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you look at some of the games that they've released on some systems, you go, oh, <laughs> I see what you're going for. <laughs> oh, oh God. What was that PS2 game? It was like a weird pub quiz thing. Oh, Buzz. And it had no. like, no, no, no. It was a really controversial one because it was like they got these girls from Ibiza to. Um, like I think it was answer oh, I the questions this. and you were competing yeah. against them, but it turns out and they were all like in bikinis and everything, and one of them was underage. Oh, I remember this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, do you remember that? Oh, yeah, this rings a bell. It's yeah, so bad. <laughs> I also can't help but laugh at it because it is moderately funny in hindsight. Yeah, I, remember, I remember when that all came out. That was a bit <laughs> weird when that all came out. I was like, what? It's a re like if you if you've ever like seen it it's really seedy it's like you look at it you go you don't care about the quiz this isn't what you came mm. here to make <laughs> who was the developer <laughs> you that. don't care about the spirit of the game <laughs> yeah the seedy side oh, yeah. of video games yeah <laughs> hot coffee <laughs> oh god well you know, that's about the right time because yeah. you know GTA GTA San Andreas came out on PS2 mm-hmm. oh I remember there was um this is this is one of the eras as well of uh when you'd share cheat codes with your yes. friends and you go oh look at this oh, cheat yeah, code back when you didn't have to pay for that yeah, yeah. there was one that <laughs> I ha- I had a friend in I think it was in high school and he gave me the he it was like oh I found this cheat you can you could spawn a ghost ship in GTA San Andreas uh, and like it's this, it's this ghost ship that you can, it, it flies and it's like semi corporeal. All you need to do is get there in a like it's it's in the middle of the sea and you can only access it if you get there in a fire engine. And there's a cheat, <laughs> and there's a cheat that you can make like the you can make the cars fly or something. <laughs> so you do that. <laughs> I was like well, going over to this place where this. This ghost ship apparently oh. was. And it was absolute bullshit. <laughs> Didn't exist <laughs> at all. <laughs> Utter shit. Oh, man, that's brilliant. Uh, <laughs> that is ex- that's what I fucking love about that era of gaming. It's just the shit people tried to peddle. It was wonderful. <laughs> It's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, I, you know, I still feel that up until maybe with the 360 and the PS3, I, I still think there was a certain amount of the Wild West going on in video oh, games. <laughs> you know, and, and it, it, over the years, it's slowly, slowly, slowly become more and more corporate. And, and you know, I, without wanting to go too much back on the old PC thing, that's what I loved about that. You know, the, the, there was that Wild West thing that came out of the early days with things like the C64 and the Amiga and all those kind of... Yeah, it was just people doing it to have fun and make things for fun. And it was just this all big, this big open market, whereas you don't get that nowadays. No, exactly. You know, and, and, and things were limitless in many respects, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of feel like the PS2 was the last sort of... Or that generation was the last generation where, the, where that was a thing, you know. As, and you, I mean... The other thing you got back then, you used to get all the um, the demo discs oh, as well. So you know you can. I had a lot of PS2 demo know. discs. <laughs> you get them in magazines or something. Like I got a, I used to get a magazine every month or so. It's called Games Master. They've gone bust now. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. it came with a cheat book every month, and all of the, none of the cheats really changed. It was just the same ones. So every month I'd look through it like, oh, have they got any new ones? Have they got any new ones? No, no new ones. It's like whatever comes out in the first week or two is all you're getting. And then, yeah, and, and you'd sometimes get a demo disc with it and you'd just be like, oh, I'm playing this game. Oh, I can't play anymore. 
Because <laughs> obviously I was really young <laughs> and I didn't understand what a demo was. <laughs> oh, dear, dear. But yeah. That... It used to be fun, though, because you, you'd find all sorts of... It's, it's, you know, it's a bit like you, get, you used to get this on the front of magazines for music as well. You'd go out and you'd get something and you'd, you'd come across new bands that way as well. So you'd come across new games, games you might not have oh, played. Yeah. You stick in the demo disc, have a go at it. Oh, I quite like this. I'll give it a go. And if if you could afford it, you'd go out and buy it. Exactly. I, mean, I don't know about you, but often I couldn't afford well, it, no. so I didn't go out and buy it. But uh... <laughs> I was a child, so I got bought what I got bought. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's a really interesting yeah. thing. Actually, now that you say that, uh, is you know you kind of ended up with whatever you were provided first. So count was like PlayStation. I was Nintendo. It wasn't a choice. It's just what we were given and what. Yeah. No, it's what you got hmm. bought. Like up until your sort of late teens, you you get to play what your mm-hmm. parents decide is okay. Exactly, and that but that's completely defines you as a gamer for the rest of your life. It does. It really defines how you look at games because for, this is an aside. I got bought a Wii when it was that generation of consoles, and I feel like I am a very different gamer now to how I would be if I'd been given one of the other two consoles. Mm. Yeah, I, I feel like I would. I, w- I could have just ended up as one of the cod bros <laughs> if I'd have got one of the other two, <laughs> you know, because you just end up like, oh, I just play cod with my friends. And that's it wouldn't all you even end up be a late for you count because it's like, you know, you love metal and you cod could fall straight into that. That whole thing, you know. Well, they had Event Sevenfold on one of the soundtracks. Like, it's, it's a crazy thought, though, isn't it? It just really is crazy how it just defines you and it wasn't even your choice. But you can say that about exactly. everything your parents did to you, so... True. Well, you know, I played Wii Sports the other week and I had fun, so it's good stuff. It holds up because it's fun. Oh, dear. And that's what it should be. It should be fun. Exactly. You know? It, it should. And, and and sometimes I think yeah. we, without wanting to get off topic too much, I think sometimes we, we in the gaming community, people lose track of, of that, you know, and everyone's arguing with each other and getting up in arms about some game not being released on time or being released too early and it's not working properly. And we get all wrapped up in all that kind of stuff. Whereas actually at the end of the day, this is something that we do to pass the time when we're not at mm. work, you know? Yeah. It's something you're supposed to have fun <laughs> exactly. with. Like, you're welcome to not enjoy something, but to get angry and up in arms about it is... Pokemon cough. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, I fucking hate the fan base that I'm a part of. It's horrible. <laughs> uh, I, I've learned over the years that every time you get involved in a group, sooner or later, they're going to disappoint you. Yes. If you don't know, uh, some segments of the Pokemon fan base have been sending death threats to uh, Nintendo and Game Freak employees, so much so they've had to cancel an event recently. Uh, not only that, there's a site called Cerebi, which is like a news slash database site. Nothing to do with Nintendo. It's one guy that runs it. That guy's been receiving death threats because, of course, he has. Oh, for crying out loud. What's wrong with Fuck people? Fuck the Pokemon. I know. <laughs> I hate everything. Get a fucking grip. Get a life. Get- if you think sending death threats is in any way reasonable, you're a fucking idiot. In, 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 in any you know, walk of life, you know, politics, whatever it might be, even, even when there's people who I, who I vehemently disagree with, the idea of sending death threats to them, to me, is like... Uh, it's like, why would you do that? You look, if you for a moment think about sending a death threat for somebody, the first thing you should do once you've had that thought is ring your fucking you doctor say, yeah. and get some therapy. <laughs> yeah. Because right. you're going Let's mental. Keep it positive. <laughs> this is a positive episode about fun things. I like the PS2. It had Tom and Jerry War of the Whiskers. It was like Smash Bros. <laughs> with Tom and Jerry characters. Ah, good. Great. We're back on track. Good. Excellent. So glad my parents never bought me a PS2. What? <laughs> Fuck off. That game was amazing. I love it's that like game. The era of <laughs> Sony trying to copy Nintendo. Oh, so, nah, I'm pulling your leg count. It's a good console. Apart from when I, uh, once I think, a couple, well, maybe a couple of times, when I went round my mate Andy's house, I don't actually think I ever played the PS2, you know? You know, the, the PlayStation is a system I tried to get into twice, uh, and it didn't get me until the PS4. I think I've been over this before, but I bought a PS2 for myself and I bought a PS3 for myself. I just couldn't get into it no matter what. Just couldn't do it. And then it just clicked with the PS4. Because the PS4 is good. Um, oh, it is, yeah. Uh, uh, by the way, Tom and Jerry War of the Whiskers, since you were mocking it, was also released on Xbox, so get fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> but 
was it and released on talking Nintendo? of which <laughs> no <laughs> yes talking of which how convenient <laughs> yeah um so yeah it was released on the xbox which one was that was the ex- the original xbox yes yeah so uh, i didn't know that and i don't own it either and i've got quite a few original xbox games behind me but um yeah the original xbox that's uh The other one I want to talk about, because that was the game, or the console, that got me into consoles, really. Uh, As I said loads of times before, I played consoles prior to that, and the Mega Drive used to go around a mate's house after the pub and play the Mega Drive, and, you know, sit around and laugh and all the rest of it. But the first time I ever really sat up and took notice of a console properly, because I was, back in the day, one of those sweaty console or sweaty Peasants. PC, yeah. I, I, you know, I was a PC master race guy. I thought that people played consoles because they were idiots. Never, you know, even though I was somebody who used to go around people's houses and play console, never occurred to me that actually I played consoles too, and they were perfectly valid to play. It took me a while to realise that, and the Xbox was the the console that really started me down that road to thinking that consoles were something I should take a bit more seriously and should invest a bit more time in. And so, you know, I'm going back now and I'm looking at consoles that I never owned and never played and playing some of those games and thinking, what what was I doing? I was missing out on all these, all these you know, great experiences and great games. Question, but, though. Sorry, go on. Yeah. Just to quickly interject, you talk like getting into the console uh, space. Was it the games that specifically called out to you that you're calling yourself an idiot for like ignoring and neglecting for so long or was it also like the kind of epiphany hitting you of a living room experience and what that can offer you yeah well i I think a bit of both i mean the big change for me that that made me take notice was you know you have to remember that a lot of the time you count mentioned this just a minute ago a lot of the time it's down to your experiences and what you've played Mm -hmm. and so you tend to get sucked into a certain direction and that happened with Mm -hmm. me because when I discovered Doom, as I mentioned earlier, that sucked me down the road of playing a lot of shooters and a lot of first-person games. And so my my the, the games I played most were first-person shooters and sports games, ironically, because I played a lot of sports games and yet I wasn't taking consoles seriously. And the reality is that the console space was way better for sports games because trying mm. to play sports games on the PC was a bloody nightmare because there were no standardised controllers. But... When the Xbox came along and I saw Halo and I actually went round to a mate's house and I sat down with him and he gave me a controller and he said, take a look at this. And I sat down and I and I played Halo and didn't get it straight away because I was used to keyboard and mouse, but it only took me about half an hour, 20 minutes or half an hour. And I was starting to circle strafe and, you know, I was starting to understand the control mechanism. And after playing something like GoldenEye, on the N64, and okay, I didn't put a lot of time into the, into GoldenEye, but I had played it, and I tried to play other shooters on on console before, and I'd always thought it's a pointless waste of time trying to trying to play shooters on console for me. It was like an exercise in 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 yeah. frustration. It was how do I make this work? You know, I couldn't get it to work. When I sat down with Halo on the Xbox, it worked. Mm-hmm. You know. And so that for me was a revelation. And then add in what you just mentioned about the idea of actually I can now put this in my lounge and I can actually play in front of my telly in the lounge with my feet up and relax and kick back with a beer rather than, you know, sitting upright in a chair on my own. You know, the other thing as well is we sat and we played, there were three of us and we sat and we played Halo together. And, uh, you know, the thing where you're playing split screen or whatever, and you're actually looking on the other guy's screen to find out where he is, that kind of thing. I'm going, you're cheating, you can't do that, you know, all those kind of things. So it was a, it was a, a really different experience when the Xbox came along, and I, and I could actually play the kind of games that I liked the most at that time. I mean, my, my tastes have changed somewhat over the years. But then, you know, there was a pretty decent lineup of games, and the other thing with it as well was it, it, it did move things forward in many respects. You know, we, we've touched on this so many times, but, you know, it had a hard drive, it had online. Uh, you know, Grant talks about the online quite a lot when, you know, if he'd have been on, he probably would have mentioned that. Mm. And so it was a lot more, for me, it felt a lot more like the PC experience in, in some respects. And yet it had that, those benefits of, of being able to sit in front of a telly, put your feet up, sit back, you know, you've got a controller in your hand. 
obviously wired controller back then, which was not it had as that convenient. Nifty breakaway but though. It was a wholly different experience. The nifty little uh, breakaway, so you wouldn't trip over it. That yeah, was it did. Yeah, handy. yeah. How many times so, we've tripped over a PS2 or a 64 and ripped it out of the freaking cabinet? I yeah. don't, because I've got a wireless <sighs> PS2 controller. And the other thing as well, you didn't need any sort of breakout boxes to play multiple controllers with it. You could just, you know, you had four controller ports in the front. You had your hard drive. And then once the mod scene kicked off, the mod scene mm. on the Xbox was unbelievable. And we ended up with things like Cody and and all these all these different things that came along on the Xbox. You could you could rip your games to your hard drive and play them off the hard drive, you know? I modded my Xbox and I had a massive hard drive in there and it was just full mm. of games and you didn't have to go looking for your games. And so that was kind of a lot more modern. It was like, you know, what we have now with downloads, although obviously you weren't downloading them, you were putting the disc mm. in and ripping it. And if you were being a bit dodgy, you could actually, you know, rent them from Blockbusters and rip them to your hard drive and play them. But- <laughs> it's hot, it's hot. <laughs> shh, shh, don't tell anyone. You're but- part of why Blockbusters <laughs> went out of business. <laughs> Yeah, that's the fact fault. that they didn't buy Netflix when they had the chance. Oh, <laughs> well, um, yeah. Uh, the, the, but, you know, we, so having all that on the Xbox, it really did change the way I perceived games. And I think it did for a lot of people as well. I knew a couple of PC gamers who, who also ended up with Xboxes. You know, my mate Johnny got a, an Xbox, I think, on the back of seeing it around my mate Rich's place. And it was it was great. And, and then latterly uh, you you read the stories that actually the the guys at xbox were taking these modded xbox into microsoft and showing bill gates and that led to some of the stuff that came about on the 360 That's, so the xbox like the red was, ring of death <laughs> well yeah that i think i think that was something they would rather have not done and and i could tell you oh, some stories yeah. about that um <laughs> Oh man, I actually got in touch with Don Matrick over that one. Wow. I was talking to Don Matrick's secretary in the middle of the night because she rang me at American time and we're, you know, five hours ahead or whatever, like three in the morning. So I'm talking to, to Don Matrick's secretary on the phone because I kicked up such a fuss about the number of Xboxes that I'd had fail. It was ridiculous. But anyway, <laughs> that's, that's, we'll get into that in a minute. So anyway, like I say, the, the, all the all the mod scene and everything led into, I think, some of the development that occurred with the 360. So for me, in some ways, it was a, a bridge between the previous generation and the next generation because in many respects it was also, given the games that were on there, you know, we had a lot of games that would have been on a, a, a Sega system ended up on the Xbox. Uh, so, it, you know, a lot of people talk about it as being the Dreamcast 2. But then also it pushed things forward for what was to come with online and a hard drive. And, you know, you don't have to worry about getting memory cards and shit like that. It was just there. It would save those save games to the hard drive. And so it was it was a big step forward for me. And as I say, it led on to the 360. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> nice little segue there for Absolutely. you, Sully. Absolutely. Uh, just to uh, tack on to the end of yours, Joe, uh, I just wanted to mention like the the ease of LAN partying once the Xbox arrived as well. Um, you know, I mean, obviously the PC LAN party was nothing new at that point, but being able to just pick up and go, kind of in a transitional world between all online and still having to go to your buddy's house, it it nailed it. Um, landing was a, a pinch, you know, plug it in and go, simple as that. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, which is something you couldn't do with PC. It was it was cumbersome and hard to move your PC and a monitor around. Um, whereas you know Xbox, you know you didn't even have to have a TV for every single Xbox. You just could split screen it, and you could get away with you know four consoles would suit sixteen people. Yeah, yeah. Well, you get a Game Boy with one of those weird four way link yeah. cables. <laughs> Who remembers that? <laughs> I don't remember it, but I have read about it. Yeah, I've seen them. Yeah. They're- pretty fucking weird it's like the pokemon games you could have like um when ruby and sapphire came out they had double battles in them so you could have like four trainer battles i think that was with emerald and you'd need a four-way link cable to do it bloody hell <laughs> it's just kind of mad when you think about that it. even makes my video talking about how you can play splatoon 2 on the switch with two players uh which gets rather convoluted because obviously you need two copies of the game and then you need two switches. You can't, you know, 
as opposed to the previous edition, which was on the Wii U, where you could just, you know, sit down and play the bloody game. And it wasn't split screen, you, but, but you had two screens. You had your telly and you had the screen on the controller. Can you not play local multiplayer with Splatoon mm, 2? Nope. Fuck me. Wow. I know, it's an really oversight. annoying. <laughs> it, I bought it for local multiplayer because me and my lad used to play. It was one of the games we yeah. played a lot on the Wii U. And then when I got, I got it and I couldn't, I was like, how do you, how do you set this up? And I, there was no way to set it up. And I'm like, I'm going to have to check this out. I must be going stupid or something because I can't get it to work. I thought, you know, sometimes the menus are a bit convoluted, but I was, I was just, oh, maybe I'm had enough sleep or something. So I looked it up online and it, <laughs> there was no option. There's no local. So, wow. yeah, I wasn't best pleased. <laughs> yeah, we went backwards in a lot of ways uh, this generation with split screen and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um. Oh, did you hear recently, actually, um, a few games on PC have had, like, they've, they've released and they, they've had local multiplayer only. They've had no online option. That's been slated a bit. There's things like um, Lovers in a Dangerous Space Time. All right. Uh, it's, it was like a this weird co-op game and everyone like, a lot of people criticised it because it didn't have online. It was only local multiplayer. But mm-hmm. Steam have added a feature, or they're adding a feature soon, where it's it, they're basically every game that has local only will be able to have online multiplayer without having to update their games. Oh, like the developers idea. don't have to do anything. It's all on Steam's end. That's a great idea. I know. Bravo Steam. About time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Innovations. Mm. So we can safely say that this is going to happen with the Epic Game Store next, yeah? Ha <laughs> ha! <laughs> <laughs> anyway moving on where, to the xbox 360 we? um yes well uh like the n64 i tried to pick my consoles on you know for specific reasons so the, the n64 was that kind of gobsmacking moment of 3d worlds and you know nintendo titles for the first time uh 360 for me was in a lot of ways very similar to the original xbox um, but it, it did one thing more for me than the original Xbox did, and that was uh, online gaming. Um, the 360 for me was when online gaming for me went from almost none to every freaking night, uh, every day after school, every day after work for like almost that entire generation. Um, and, it, it you know, it changed me as a gamer in many ways. Um, you know, you, you start developing a lot of little clicky and niche communities across titles, um, you know, Call of Duty, Halo, um, you know, I made new friends, um, quite literally. So it changed me as a gamer in a lot of ways. And, it, you know, it not only did it change me as a gamer, but, you know, it changed the experiences I wanted out of games. Um, you know, this was like the coming of age for multiplayer, you know, so I'd look at titles instead of, you know, being a single player experience to what is this going to be like online as a multiplayer experience, you know, for, you know, over a long period of time. Um, and specifically, the 360, the titles I do remember, uh, obviously Halo 3, um, specifically the original Gears of War. If you made me pick a title, I would give you the original Gears of War um, as a multiplayer experience. That was mm-hmm. just insanity. Uh, you know, the Unreal Engine on Xbox 360 done well by Epic. Like, pfft, it was unreal, quite literally. Um, that That game was... It was groundbreaking in, in so many ways, and it uh, you know it looked amazing oh. when you know when it came out as well. The 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 look of the thing it was absolutely yeah, it blew me away when it first came out. Definitely, um, and I'm I'm the same as you. I I went from you know being primarily about single player games to mm. being almost exclusively mm. an online game I mean, at that point. I want to be careful with how I say exclusively because there were a lot of single player titles I did really enjoy. Um, like obviously finishing the fight, you know, Halo 3 and Gears of War's campaign was phenomenal. Um, mm. But then, you you know, you got the other side of the fence where you do really look at some titles as just being like a uh, multiplayer experience, like freaking all the Call of Duties that came out on the 360. You know, it must have been like a hundred of them. Um, you know, specifically. <laughs> yeah. I think the only one that you could say has a, a charitably Black good Ops one. plot, like single um, player is COD 4. Black Ops 1? No. Okay. Oh, ugh. I really enjoyed Black oh. Ops One. COD Four. No. COD Four. COD Four. Good. <laughs> That's yeah, the COD only good fantastic. one. I have to admit, I like that more than Modern Warfare Two. But yeah, the, the Call of Duty series are obviously in that generation in its prime. 
um, it's n- not been nearly as close this generation. Um, but it was that perfect storm and perfect timing of the military shooter, online features, pretty good campaigns, uh, you know, teenagers wanting to shoot each other. Like, it all came together at the perfect time, everything. Um, but the 360, for me, was one of those consoles that really took the value of gaming and, like, for what you could get for, like, kind of the buy-in price and push it to its limits. I, yeah, I'd agree with that. And, and, and you know, <laughs> Red Ring of Death aside, it was a phenomenal console. Um, oh, absolutely. That, that, I mean, that was almost unforgivable, what happened with the Red Ring. But the fact that it still remained, for oh. much of the generation, it remained the best-selling console, but certainly between the, the Xbox and the PlayStation. I know the PlayStation caught it towards the end. But, Depends how you define it, because didn't the Wii outsell it? Well, yeah, but I, I, I kind of... I kind of yeah. see the Wii as a slightly different proposition anyway. I think, you know, Nintendo it's were looking prob- in a... Comp- yeah, Nintendo just do their own... I do wonder... <laughs> yeah, exactly. I do wonder how much the sales are kind of almost artificially inflated because people either trying to stay in front of the Red Ring of Death or getting a new model because they like it and also he's trying to stay in front of the Red Ring, Red Ring of Death because I'm not proud of this. I, I did get one Ring Red of Death... Uh, Red Ring of Death console, sorry, um, that I had to send off to get repaired. But after that, I flogged it, bought a new one. And then I heard there were issues with a new one. And then I flogged it uh, a year later and I bought a new one. <laughs> but because but, but every single time I bought a new console, you know, it was it was better value, right, in a lot of ways. Because, you know, there was all these bundles. Uh, the hard drives were getting way bigger every single time they, you know, released a new model. And then, you know, we also had the Xbox E with that kind of black yeah. mirror finish, which looked incredible. And I think it came with a 500 gigabyte hard drive. Um, there was a lot of reasons uh, that I think were worthwhile reasons to upgrade, but to also escape the red ring of death and your warranty running out. So I do wonder how much it was inflated by people like me who did buy like three 360s over the course of its life cycle. Yeah. That's that's an interesting take, actually. I, I'd not thought of it like that, but that could well have done, done you know, changed the mm. the way people bought it. I I mean, the flip side of that, obviously, is that some people might have jumped ship to PlayStation because they got bloody fed up with it. I got to the point where I was pulling my bloody hair out, what little I had left at that point. And I, I'd had something like four or five wow. that, that had gone wrong. I think four that went wrong. I've still got one actually sat on the shelf at the moment in its box that's actually faulty and is on its way to a red ring. I think that would be an awesome video if that red ringed and you were to fix that. That would be really cool. (laughs) I'd have to sit there filming it. Yeah, that would be sick. (laughs) I'd watch that. Watch you pull your hair out. Yeah. But that happened to me, though, Sully. What happened is that I got so fed up with the... uh, with the red ring mm. and keep getting new consoles. I had one that was replaced and within like days of me getting the replacement, it had red ring. Oh my so God. I was get, you know, I was, I was so fed up with it. And in the end, Dawn bought me uh, one of the later models for Christmas or my birthday. It, it was a lot of models later too. A lo- it took them a long, it took them too long to fix. Um, yep. you know, I understand that they probably printed a bajillion of these machines for launch day. Um, and you know, there was a lot out there in the wild, but this shit, you know, it took more than one revision to fix the issue, and uh, I'm pretty yeah. sure that's the case. You can maybe Google it just to be sure. But the, I think it was the Elite. When I got the Elite, I think that was the first model that didn't have the yeah. red ring. I might be wrong on that. Mine's never red ringed anyway. I feel like there might have been some kind of stopgap stuff that they tried out, you know, in a pinch to try and probably keep the manufacturing process going to meet demand. Um and that's probably why we got a couple of iterations or revisions that didn't fix the issue. Um, but yeah, it was yeah. too long. It was it was definitely. I mean, credit to them, they did like extend warranties and they honoured everyone's uh, to the best of my knowledge. And they certainly looked after me. Um, they honoured their warranties. Oh yeah, they, they they sorted out that the the issue I had was it was a like a twenty eight day turnaround yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah. So. That was bad enough when it went wrong the first time, but when you got another one back and it went wrong within days of getting it and they wanted you to take another 28 days, yeah. I was not happy. That's, that's <laughs> weird, isn't it? Because obviously it's a it's a flexing of the board and solder breaking and all that kind of stuff, which is weird considering your climate that you seemingly had a lot more issues than what I had with mine in a much warmer climate. Yeah. Mm. I think, you know... I, I, 
Maybe it's because it's consistently warm in Australia, whereas the UK is more fluctuating. True. Or yeah, internal heating, or maybe Joe had his on in a cabinet. don't know. Yeah, I, I'd be interested to know, because it was something like a 50% failure rate. Mm. But I, I was talking to Dawn last night about this, actually, and I was saying that I'd be interested to see what the failure rate would be over a slightly longer period of time. Because 100%. given that it was a, a an almost built problem, it was built into the system, I wouldn't be at all surprised that over a long enough timeline, it would be, well, long enough timeline, a long enough timeline, everything fails. But over a slightly longer timeline, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see it, it probably even went beyond a 50% failure rate. Mm. I would imagine it would be heading towards 100% because it was just a problem with the design, wasn't mm. it? It was it was going to fail at some point. This stuff gets hot and when it gets hot and it gets brittle and it breaks, you, you can't escape that. You know, they all had that same uh, flex solder joint issue. So, um, yeah. yeah, there was no real way around kind of staving it off i do remember the patch job fixes that were floating around they they were they were great like wrapping your (laughs) xbox in a tea towel and turning it upside down and turning it on for 20 minutes surprisingly (laughs) enough work taking the taking the board out and 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 turning a heat gun on it to mount the joints and yeah i went to my mate's dad's house once and he was fixing a 360 and a ps3 at once and put both the boards in the oven good times Um, (laughs) yeah it worked (laughs) That seems yeah. safe. It, it worked. It worked on both nice. of them. Yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah. So uh, we're talking about something that failed a lot, but the one you want to talk about, the DS, the thing I can remember about that most is, well, even now, is what really impressed me about the DS was the battery in the bloody thing. Because yeah. uh, it was surprisingly competent. <laughs> Yeah, I pull mine out of a drawer now. I've had it for years. I, ba- I barely oh, play yeah. it, but I pull I it out. Pull still out bloody DS works. And it'll still, like, it's probably not as good as it used to be, but it'll still go pretty damn well. Yeah, they, I'll tell you, they, they've lasted a lot better than um, the Game Boy Advance SP batteries. They don't go anywhere near as well as they used to anymore. <laughs> uh, maybe but they the, learnt their lesson. They did. The DS ones are great. Also, just out of... I've I've looked everything up out of curiosity. I have accidentally picked the two best-selling consoles of all time. <laughs> of course you have. <laughs> the PS2 and the DS are the uh, are the two most successful video game consoles ever. Amazing. Well, there's a good reason in itself to choose them, isn't it? Yeah. They're very close to each other units-wise as well. 155 and 154 million units. Is the DS a weird one to take the Game Boy crown? It feels like a weird one. No, okay. I don't think it is. Not the th- because yeah. it did, it did so many things weird and different and interesting that I that you can't help but admire it. Okay, because when you look at the DS and the hardware it had, it was so underpowered. Yeah, but it made use of all of that power. Mm. It it just did an amazing job of using what it had at its disposal. It's a, it's a thing that Nintendo are very good at doing. Mm. It's just using, making the most of what they have. The same with you know with the Switch now or the, even the, yeah. the 3DS as well. When you look at it, it's still quite underpowered, but they've done a pretty good they, job with it when you look at it. They do not do overkill at all. They don't. And I think that's one of the reasons that they won out over the PSP because the PSP mm. launched in the same year as the DS. And they've nearly doubled the sales units. Well, bloody sore off the PSP and the Vita, didn't it? Mm. Yeah, let's not mention the Vita. That's <laughs> just <laughs> Leave that in a corner somewhere. Oh, I got rid I of like my Vita, Vita recently because I don't fucking play it. <laughs> no, I like the Vita. I do like the Vita. I like the idea of the Vita. The Vita in practice is just there's nothing to it because there's no games to play. <laughs> Well, the biggest one of the biggest problems with the Vita for me was sorry, you're getting off topic, but was the the proprietary menu me, menu me, memory. Oh yeah, yeah, that was yeah. They're, they're they're the special Sony memory card that only fits in certain Sony devices. Fucking stupid yeah. idea. I had someone come into work with two of those the other day, and I was just oh, like, hell. "Great, <laughs> that's that's a slot in our card reader that we've never used." <laughs> 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 oh dear, um, yeah. So, yeah, the DS is just a masterclass of how to do something weird and get away with it. Because when you look at it, if you look back at it, when it's launched, you think, what the... F-? A lot of people must have thought, what the fuck is this? 
So it's a it's a device with two screens. That's me. One of them's a weird. <laughs> one of them's a weird capacitive touch screen, and you you need to use a pen to do things with it. For, somehow they managed to get people to develop for it, rather than just let looking at them going, "What the fuck have you made? I'm not touching that with a barge pole." <laughs> They it made... is amazing that it went on to sell so well, really, when you think about it. Yeah, but at the same time, it's it's so weird that it works. Like, and it, and I mean, it, it's got a good library as well, hasn't it? That's oh, it's got thing. a great library. It's got some of the best Pokemon games are on the original DS. Uh, it's got things like The World Ends With You. That's now come out on Switch. It's been remastered, but that was originally a DS release. They had a port of Chrono Trigger on the DS. That's so a, funny. That's apparently quite good. Then, then you've got like the, you've got the more obscure things. You've got things like Cooking Mama, and you know, <laughs> scoff all you like. Cooking Mama is a fun little game. I like no, Cooking well, Mama. Well, I'm not judging. You could also all. get things like that. cartridges with like uh, a, a cookery book. <laughs> yeah, uh, we've we've got downstairs. It's like a hundred and one books or something. Yeah, like, it's, it's just some books that you can read, <laughs> and there's like, um, well, there's like a hundred and one little cut games, and it was like solitaire and all these old card games and whatever that you can play, or loads of just weird stuff like that, and it's great. <laughs> it's, there was something for everyone in that because what one of the things that really helped them as well, they got into the adult market with that shit. Like they got into the middle aged white lady brain games buying a ds yes. and they're do they're they're reading the books and whatever and then they go Ooh, brain training yeah that's that sounds like a good idea keep myself nice and sharp brain training incidentally is really fun i like brain training it is fun and i had my sister and my mum playing it yeah it's great my mum used to play it as well and then you, it it just carries on like that, and then you, they, they can go further down. They go, ooh, Nintendo dogs! I can look after virtual dogs. Oh, those were very good times looking after those virtual dogs. <laughs> I think I played that game for all of about twenty minutes. Oh, I used to love that game. I played so much of that. And then you got Animal Crossing Wild World, which is one of my favourite. It got me into the series. I love Animal Crossing. It was the first handheld release for Animal Crossing. And it's just wonderful. It's the variety of games, like not just the quality, because there was a lot of shovelware on the DS as well. Yeah. But th the variety as well as the quality of the of the good stuff is just, oh, it's it's brilliant. I love the DS so much. Yeah, the, the, the <laughs> DS DS was one that I just I just completely missed. Never got into it. What you can do, get a 3DS. I had a 3DS, just, sorry, you, but like the actual just oh, did, just the you? DS. Um, I just completely skipped it. Yeah, but if it. you get a 3DS, you can play standard DS mm. games on it. I played a lot of them on the 3DS, yeah. Like I played the Pokemons or a lot of bits and pieces of the Pokemons, like Fire Emblem, a lot of puzzle games, all that kind of stuff. But like, yeah, I just for some reason, like I think it was probably just my age. Like I just missed it. Like I kind of got to the Game Boy. I had mostly Game Boy, Game Boy Color, uh, Game Boy Advance. Oh, and then you then you got to the edge yeah. of it. Oh, I hate and then I became an cool. adult uh. gamer account, and I played Halo. Uh, yeah, no, I think it was just an age thing. Like I just kind of fell off, and you know, then now that I've kind of come full circle again with the Switch and dabbled with the 3DS quite a bit, but yeah, I yeah. mean, I just remember like the the DS to me was just one of these weird, really weird, and it's going to sound bad, but fucking ugly. Uh, consoles. I just hated it. The original DS Gross. is hideous. Oh. Here's a little side story. My original DS I had to stop using because I spilled orange juice on it <laughs> and the buttons got all sticky and they wouldn't <laughs> work properly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a terrible design. It's the least sexy machine console they've made. I like, no, I like the DS Lite. The DS Lite to me has mm. a certain appeal to it. See, I, I feel like the, I the 3DS should have been just the actual DS design. Like, surely it wasn't that hard of a leap for them to make. But no, they went this weird clamshell. But the thing that did it for me about the DS design, well, not the clamshell specifically, it's not the dual screen, it's none of that. It's the fact that on the top bit, the top screen, they've got this little weird ridges around the edges. Uh... Oh, yeah, they did. I've just, forgotten about oh, that. It's like not flush. I hate it. Whereas a 3DS, it, everything's 
flash well, and it works. That, to be fair, that was only on the original DS. The yeah. DS Lite had a flat screen. There was no weird uh, yeah. bevel in. Thanks, so, God. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the best things about the DS as well, the original DS and the DS Lite, is that you could play Game Boy Advance games on it as well. Mm. So backwards Very compatibility. Good, yeah. So you, you, you weren't just like, oh, I... I I'm just not going to play any of these old games anymore because I want to play the DS. It's like, oh, no, I can still just do that. And they had certain features where, you know, like in the Pokemon games, you could have features where you plug in your Game Boy cartridge while you're playing the DS one, and then you could do things with mm. them both. Nintendo's always At the risk of sounding like a dodgy pirate again, the other good thing about oh. it was it was very easy to load a load of games up onto an SD card and bung them in there and take it with you. Yeah, it, it didn't have the best security in the world. <laughs> the pirate police are coming for you, Joe. They're coming. Uh. <laughs> Yar! I actually, the, the reason I did that, though, the reason I, I, I bunged a load of games on an SD card, basically we were going on holiday. This was before James was born, so it's a while ago. But we were we were going on holiday, and uh, I I just bunged a load of games on an SD card, nice. and and had one of those little um, cartridges that you put the SD card in, and you mm -hmm. and uh, just took a load of games with me on holiday. It meant I didn't have to take cartridges with me. It was dead yeah, easy. Yeah, makes sense. And I had a whole load of games, and I just took him on the plane with me, and just played it all the while I was on the plane. I really wish. Brilliant. I would loved, and it would never ever ever happen. But I'd love to see Nintendo just release some kind of memory card cartridge like that, where instead of me taking five cartridges around with me in my travel case, I could just load them all onto my one card and just leave that one card in, you know, have a five on one cartridge. Yeah, and I can't see Nintendo no. ever doing that, though. I, I would love them to do something like that. I would love them to release something like that where you could get a whole load of games that you could actually pay for that was legit, that you weren't pirating, that you could do that. It'd be fantastic. Mm. Yeah, just release like a this is the NES collection or whatever. Yeah. Just had a bunch of NES games on a on a Switch cartridge. Or maybe yeah, be if, maybe you have to buy them digitally from the store and like the digital code is assigned to your profile and once that's it. It's it's assigned to your ID. I mean there's a c there's a couple of quote unquote bundles of games mm. that you can buy on the eStore, but yeah, it's not it's not quite on that scale mm. though. That I'd like to have it on a cartridge to keep it easy, you know, because you can't just go downloading titles off the store willy nilly with a Switch. Uh, you run out of space real quick. Yeah. Yeah. But sorry, back to the uh, DS quickly and its design. It really reminds me of the Game & Watch. Yeah, absolutely. The yeah, I think that was one of the primary inspirations for the design was the Game & Watch. I trust me, I can tell. Terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I actually preferred the earlier Game & Watches with the single screen. Oh, yeah, I like those. Definitely agree with that, Joe. Uh, yeah, I remember playing. I used to play those. Uh, this is how old I am. I used to play those. I used to work in WH Smith's storeroom. I used to sit and play them when we were <laughs> supposed to be wow. doing stock taking. Yeah, I completely <laughs> missed that, unfortunately. Well, I don't know if it's unfortunate, but I completely missed it. That was well... I, I don't know. When was the Game & Watch? The mid to late 80s? Early 80s, I think. Early 80s. Uh, wow. About 83, something like that. 84. Before Nintendo were a game manufacturer, and they were just, that was, it was just a toy, wasn't it? It was, would have been considered yeah, yeah. a toy. And uh, I mean, they're, they're quite collectible now. Mm. Uh, people, you know, you see them, they, if, they're, if you get them fully boxed and all the rest of it, they can go for quite a bit of money. But mm. yeah, they're a bit, you know, quite crap by modern standards, but they were fun, you know? They were a, a lot of fun. Mm, I've never played one. On the bucket list. Are you? I mean, you wouldn't want to play one now. Mm. <laughs> I'd like to hold one, though. Yeah. No, I can't imagine they really hold up anymore. No, no. no. It's, uh, uh. yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a nostalgia thing, but it's not something you'd want to play. I mean, the, the funny thing is, I've got a modded Xbox, original Xbox, and it's got a load of, um, you know, consoles and all the rest of it on there, and it's got actually got a Game & Watch collection on there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so every so often I'll sit down and have a go at a game and watch game they're quite crap but they're fun here's a weird thing that I found it was released for the DS there was an MP3 player released for oh, it oh that's cool really? I like that it was released uh, in 2006 for £30 it, uh, the add-on uses removable SD cards to store MP3 audio files and can be used in any device that features the support for Game Boy Advance cartridge Due to this, it's limited in terms of user interface and functionality. It doesn't support both screens of the DS simultaneously, nor does it make use of touchscreen capacity. Uh, but you you can use it to play <laughs> MP3 cool. 
<laughs> it apparently That's is cool. also sort compatible of. with the Game Boy Micro and the Game Boy Advance SP. Wow. So for for any because of course yeah for anyone that's made it this far if there's if there's one takeaway from this episode do yourself a favor and go on YouTube the weird shit you didn't know Game Boys could do uh, because there's they've done some weird shit with Game Boys over the years uh, I remember one of them being sewing machine commands for the Game Boy Color um, <laughs> they've they've done some real wacky shit with each iteration of Game Boy some of it really cool some of it weird. Go check it out because it will honestly blow your mind. And you'll be like, why? But YOLO Nintendo. <laughs> that sounds hilarious. I might have to check that out. Yeah, it's really interesting stuff. You'll have to give me a link to that, Sally, and I'll put it in. Yeah, I'll see if I can find one. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So anyway, um, let's uh, move on briefly and cover some honorable, honorable mentions here. And I'm, I'm just going to rattle off a couple. Uh, I have to talk about Atari. My first console ever, though, was a thing called the Grandstand, which was basically a Pong machine with variations on. And that was a kind of grey and orange horrible thing that took ages to get to work because you had to tune in your telly to it. And then when you tried to play it, it was shit. <laughs> but, so that was my first experience <laughs> of video Amazing. games. It was basically a Pong machine. Uh, but the the first time I ever really uh, enjoyed playing video games, I suppose, in the home would have been the Atari 2600. And uh, and I actually think my brother-in-law got a hold of, a, I think it was a 7800. And uh, that was the first console, I believe, with backwards compatibility. Oh. And so I, I remember playing that one Christmas and playing a load of 2600, well, pl playing Breakout for the 2600 on it. And then obviously there's things like the Spectrum and the N the C64, the Amiga. Loved the Mega Drive, never owned one, but loved it. And I always, and I still do, wanted a Dreamcast, but never owned one. And uh, the Xbox, the original Xbox was probably the, uh, the, the another reason why I got the original Xbox was because I saw it as kind of like the, the follow-on from the Dreamcast in a way. And then obviously you've mentioned the 360, yeah, Sully. So yeah. Hmm. The Dreamcast is one of those like weird unicorn consoles to me. Like I've never even come into contact with one. I want to. I don't know if I ever will. Like it's it's just one of those weird ones. Um, sorry, that was a random thought. Uh, but my honourable mentions were the SNES. Um, a ridiculous amount of nostalgia attached to that console for me. That was my very first. Uh, I did have experience with a with NES growing up, but the SNES was the first one that was given to me. Don't need to uh, talk about that much further. You know, it's the SNES. We all know it's amazing. Um, and I think an honorable mention I'm going to give to Nintendo Switch. Uh, because I didn't think I would ever be a portable gamer again. I didn't think that environment would ever grab me ever again, let alone even potentially Nintendo. Uh, but I'm back. 110%. Nintendo's got me and I love the Switch. So um, it's too early to kind of place it anywhere in my overall rankings for video game consoles uh but it's definitely in there with a good shot i think going along into the future so do you think just mm. one one quick aside there do, do you think that part of this with the switch and i and i think this might be the case with me i saw review tech usa guy uh, rich mm. over at your review tech talking about this the other day talking about i mean obviously you haven't got kids but um Talking about how, you know, when you're a kid, you have a handheld and then you move into the more serious gaming, if you like, in inverted commas. And then you get a bit older and you haven't got a lot of time to play. And so you still want to play games, but you haven't got, you know, you, you can't sit down in front of a computer and play properly a lot of the time. Maybe you can't play in front of the telly because you've got kids running around or whatever. And so having something like the Switch is ideal because you can, you know, you, let's be honest, you can play it on the toilet. So, you know, the Switch lends itself to that. And I found for me that that's what I like about the Switch is the portability of it. And, and I actually, I think you and I mm. both agree on this. I actually prefer mm. the light to the mm. original Switch. Absolutely. Um, for that reason, I find the idea of just bunging it in a bag and taking it with me. Like I'll take it with me this afternoon when my, my mm. lad goes drumming and I'll sit in the car and play 10 minutes. Yeah, it's easy. And the system, unless you specifically try to turn it off, it always just sleeps. So you can fast resume everything. And like, I'll get up some mornings and Kelsey, my girlfriend, will be doing something and I'm like, I'm having a coffee. I'm sitting here twiddling my thumbs. I'm going to play some Switch and bang, all of a sudden you're going. Um, yeah. And like I said, yeah. it's it's almost, Nintendo's almost found the perfect storm again because they found a really good sweet spot for taking real, real AAA games and every other smaller experience on the planet 
and they've crammed it into one system in a very nice form factor and it's just pick up and go. They've nailed I'd agree with that. almost everything. Almost everything. The only shortcomings and real criticisms I have is chat, uh, pain in the ass. Really yep. want a freaking stylus pen as well because if I can't use chat, I have to use keyboard and it's a pain in the ass to type on. Um, yeah, because yep. the, the, it's the touch screen. Yeah, not good for keyboards. Fine, but the, the problem well, the problem is the type of touch screen it uses is A, they're more reliable than a capacitive touch screen, but B, pens and styluses for those kind of touch screens are a pain in the ass. Absolutely. Arse. And my only other real criticism is storage is a pain, but that's a criticism you can almost give every single Nintendo console. Um, they just, I really would love to see them yeah. just, <laughs> I don't know, just give me something affordable to stick in to get more storage space. But produce a switch with a with an SSD in it, yeah. and I've done with it. Charge a bit more money for it, and away we go. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, switch was going to be one of my honourable mentions as well. I think the other one, the other ones are going to have to be pretty much all the Game Boy systems, oh. just because that's. Those are what I played when I was growing up, are all of the various Game Boy systems. And, you know, I here's the thing. Once we've got off this recording, I'm going to go downstairs, get my Game Boy, put Pokemon Emerald in it, and play that and try and beat the story before I get Sword and Shield on Friday. <laughs> wow, you're an animal. <laughs> hey, I like Pokemon. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. I swear, every time we record, you're starting a new Pokemon save file. Well, I've played through Let's Go Eevee was the last one that I've done, and I've not done one in a few weeks, and I'm like, I really want to play one, but I don't want to wait until Sword and Shield, but I want to play one now. For those wondering, Count is addicted to Pokemon. Don't know what you're on about, mate. Have you, (laughs) has anybody played uh, Link's Awakening yet for Switch? Yes, it's great. I love it. It's amazing. I really enjoy it. it. I really enjoy it. I'm recommending it right now, endorsing it. Go get it. It's it's. It's the a cutest experience you'll ever play, and it's a lot of fun, and it's, it's still challenging. wonderful. The only thing I have against it is it has slight performance issues. Yes. It has some frame rate dips. And it looks a bit Other gross. than that, it's a fucking phenomenal. It does not look gross. It looks adorable. I I hate that freaking um, blur or depth of field effect they have on the screen. Um, I quite like it. Oh, it drives me nuts. You'll, you'll love or hate it, you know, um, from what I've read, but... <laughs> The actual game itself oh, is wonderful. You phenomenal. need to go play it. The oh. word charming is oh. what applies to that game. Yes, it's, definitely. It's like you're looking at like these perfectly polished like miniatures. Um, yeah, it's, amazing. it's like they've just made this. What it's like you you can imagine someone having made this as a big diorama. Mm. It's amazing. Oh. do yourself a favor because yes. that's the Switch experience, like in a nutshell. That game. That's you know, it's just on point. Well, there may be some cutting involved in this episode, Joe, because we're at an hour and 17 minutes. Yeah. I'm I'm just going to cut you guys out and leave myself on because I like talking to you, but, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to Chip Chat. It's just me here today. (laughs) I thought it might be this morning when Grant dropped off. Well, yeah. (laughs) Oh, dear. Right. So anyway, uh, I think we're pretty much done now, aren't we? Yep. Yeah. So, do you guys just want to tell us where we can find you? Gamecast, uh, Count and I, and I believe Mark, and hopefully a couple other people will be uh, getting into, I believe, regular podcastings on Wednesday for US and UK and Thursdays for Australia. So, we're aiming for a live podcast format. We have a couple of episodes up now. Yeah, and we're, we're hoping to, I think, just basically evolve that format into... Something we enjoy. Uh, We don't know exactly what that will be yet. Uh, We're trying to discuss and cover kind of the hot topics that take our interest each week. Um, And we could go anywhere with it from that point. Um, So that's that's probably where you'll find Count and I mostly in the future. Um, So, yeah. Cool. And I'll uh, I'll put a link into those guys. And you should check them out. They've got loads of content on their channel. And they are transitioning into this new format. Mm. So check them out. It's always worth listening to them chat, especially when they're not on with me, because then you haven't got me droning on for half an hour. But anyway, uh, (laughs) that's us done. Uh, You know where to find me, because this is my channel. So uh, just click on other videos and uh, you can hear me droning on some more. (laughs) And uh, yeah, I'm going to get a cup of tea. Don't know what these guys are doing. And I'll speak to you guys in the next one. Bye. Bye. Oof. (laughs) 